Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. I am Louise Palenker. You should consider Media Path a very selective vetting process for your entertainment options. Wheezy and I comb bookstores and theater listings and TV schedules in search of things we think you'll find interesting. Then, as if that weren't enough, we have amazing guests, many of the media icons, household names, talented people who are woven into the fabric of American culture, people whose names, once they retire, are retired from show business, like Potsy. Mm. That's right. Anson Williams of Happy Days fame. And he's so much more. He's more three-dimensional than you even knew. And he's going to be with us today in just a couple of seconds. Can't wait to talk to Anson. Wheezy, what do you have for us? Wow, Fritzy, you really make this sound like a good show. (laughs) Sorry. Um, So I'm obsessed with this book that I finished called The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. You know she's a good author when she has three names. (laughs) So... This is a book about the mythical Evelyn Hugo, aging and reclusive Hollywood movie icon Evelyn Hugo is finally ready to tell the truth about her glamorous and scandalous life. But when she chooses unknown reporter Monique Grant for the job, no one is more astounded than Monique. All will be revealed and it's twisty and dishy as hell. What we learn as Evelyn begins to talk is that in old school Hollywood, seven husbands were often obfuscating the one person you really did love. Summoned to Evelyn's luxurious apartment, Monique listens in fascination as the actress spins a tantalizing tale of ambition, adventure, artistry, seven husbands, and forbidden love. How does Monique's story ultimately intersect with Evelyn's? The answer is neither disappointing nor predictable. I am obsessed with this book, absolutely mesmerizing, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I can't wait to read this book. Now, do you think this was fashioned after one particular person's real story in Hollywood? Rock Hudson, one of those people? Yes. According to the internet, Tab Hunter. Oh. Yes, because he wrote a book and he, there was a documentary. So, and a lot, and we all know kind of about Cary Grant and Randolph Scott and sort of like, you know, in their 30s, the studios were like, you guys can't continue to be roommates, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get married. So people would marry other gay people and then kind of like the couples would arrange to live near each other so that the guy could date the guy and the girl could date the girl. But it was tricky. And yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. What an awful way to live. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about Dear Evan Hansen. It's not streamable yet. I'm sure it will be, but it's released in theaters last Friday. It's based on the hugely popular Broadway musical that won nine Tony Awards. It's about Evan Hansen, played by Ben Platt, who, uh, as a side note, was a graduate of Harvard Westlake School right here in Los Angeles, oh. playing a high school student who suffers social anxiety. His therapist suggests an exercise where he writes a letter to himself every day expressing all the good things about life. Those letters begin, Dear Evan Hansen. Don't want to give away too much of the plot, but another troubled teen whose name is Connor Murphy, also without friends, also socially awkward, snatches Evan's letter away from him at school one day as kind of a bullying tactic. And Connor also signs Evan's broken arm cast, not as a friend, as a sarcastic gesture. He signs it in big letters with a Sharpie. And then Connor Murphy is found dead the next day, having taken his own life. And he's found with Evan's letter in his pocket. Now, the letter and the signing of Evan's cast seem to suggest to the dead boy's parents that their son actually had a friend. And they manically clung to that theory, thinking he did have a friend before he died. Well, Evan didn't have the heart to tell them it wasn't true. And also because of his own need to be loved, he played up the idea that he and Connor actually were friends. All I'll say is the ruse got out of hand. The movie also starts Amy Adams, Juliet Moore. I loved it because I thought it was just a touching portrayal of teenage angst reflected in songs like Waving Through the Window, which is this boy wondering if anybody would even notice if he were alive. I have a 21-year-old daughter. These are horrible times to be a teenager where everything seems like it's the end of the world, and that comes close to reality thanks to social media. I thought it was a great movie. Not everybody did. You you read the criticisms online. It was astonishing to me what people said about this movie. Yes, the Internet was obsessed 
with the age of Ben Platt and failing to kind of grasp the whole concept that Ben Platt is an actor. He's playing a part. So he originated the role and you can kind of understand how, just like, you know, we wanted to see Lin-Manuel Miranda in the film version, you know, for posterity, we want to see Ben Platt play Evan Hansen. Now, when I saw Evan Hansen on Broadway, there was a teenager who was brilliantly played Evan Hansen. So the internet may have thought that, why don't you, you know, why don't you let that kid, you know, that kid was really good. I wish I had his name at the tip of my mind, but I don't. But to me, from all the clips that I've seen, Evan Hansen looks like a teenager. Fonzie looked like a teenager. They're actors. Yeah. I, I, I thought, uh, there, I, I didn't for one minute think that was an issue watching this movie. He played that really uncomfortable in his own skin teenage thing. I thought he was wonderful. Plus, he's a spectacular singer. And there were some complicated songs in there that weren't really melodic. They were just kind of improvised in minor notes and stuff. He's really a gifted guy. I, I, was, I, I, I couldn't believe the, some of the criticisms. I thought it was a wonderful movie. Well, I can't wait until it's streaming into my living room because I'm not yet confident enough to go into a movie theater and eat popcorn next to singing, dancing strangers. You're not alone. Yeah. So, oh, do you want to know what I'm going to recommend yeah. next? Okay. So I've been watching Impeachment, American Crime Story on FX. It's the third installment in FX's award-winning limited series. They did OJ, remember, and then they did the assassination of Gianni Versace. And season three examines the national crisis that led to the first impeachment of a U.S. president in over a century. It tells the story through the eyes of the three women at the center of the tornado. These would be Monica Lewinsky, played by Beanie Feldstein, Linda Tripp, played by Sarah Paulson, and Paula Jones, played by Annalee Ashford. All three were thrust into the public spotlight during a time of corrosive partisan rancor. Sound familiar? Anybody? <laughs> uh, shifting sexual politics and a changing media landscape. The series shows how power lifts some and disposes of others in the halls of our most sacred institutions. And may I add that, yes, the GOP spent Clinton's entire two terms in office digging for dirt rather than governing and allowing him to govern. For example, al-Qaeda sent a suicide bomber to blow up the coal battleship in Yemen, killing 17 U.S. sailors. Had this been more fully investigated, we may have been able to prevent 9-11. However, this is what I want to say about Clinton's behavior. Kids are going to have crushes on teachers and interns are going to have crushes on politicians. It is up to the person on top of that power dynamic to not act upon it. Bill Clinton's inability to control his impulses was a fatal flaw in his presidency. And before we throw our full weight behind a candidate, they need to be better vetted. This should apply to both sides of the aisle. Yeah. And you pointed out to me, and I remembered it because I saw it, the documentary about Hillary on Hulu. He, he confesses to having had either a sexual addiction or that was a preoccupation of his for most of his life. So. Yeah, he talks about it as being sort of an escape from all the pressure that he felt he was under. And he just felt like he needed to kind of disappear for those moments that he spent with Monica. And she seems like a really cool person. So I'm kind of impressed with her ability to have been the most bullied person in the history of the world. And... She's not what you would uh, presuppose her to be. She did a TED Talks on PBS, and I just was dialing by, and it was very impressive. She was very warm and smart and articulate. And, and you funny. better, and you she's better, funny. yeah, you better follow have, her on Twitter. She's funny. You better, uh, you better have it together if you're going to be doing TED Talks and telling other people how to live. That's right. She, she was really good. Well, and plus, Sarah Paulson is Linda Tripp. Oh my God, off the hook. So terrifying. Yeah, she yeah. was really good. All right, this is this is. Um, I, I'm I. I, I guess it's a depressing subject, but it has a, a heroic ending. I, I read a book about Ethel Rosenberg, of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, and this is about her. It's called An American Tragedy by Anne Seba. Now, the boomers in our audience may have a fuzzy recollection of the trial of Julius, Eth Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They were put to death for having passed secrets about the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union at the start of the Cold War at the end of World War II. Julius was- I can't imagine anybody uh, cooperating with Russia. Like, who would do that? <laughs> right. Julius, <laughs> Julius was an electrical engineer- who worked at Los Alamos in New Mexico developing the atomic bomb for the Manhattan Project. Julius and Ethel were both admitted communists. That wasn't the question. This was before the horrors of Stalin were made known, 
and American communists thought Russian communism would be a wonderful thing for the rest of the world. Julius's involvement was not disputed, but his wife Ethel's involvement in spying was pretty much fabricated, fabricated by her own brother. David Greenglass, who was part of the Soviet plot, lied and said Ethel had typed information for Julius to give to the Soviets. He did that to save his own wife, Ruth's neck, to get her off the hook. Who, she was actually involved in the plot. Okay. So you had Ethel's brother who betrayed her. You had the infamous Roy Cohn, oh. who was the assistant prosecutor in the case, who fabricated facts against her. He's like evil gump. Oh, my God. Seriously. <laughs> you that had guy's a- everywhere. You had a judge who was bowing to public pressure because all the anti-communist fervor at the time. Both Rosenbergs were found guilty during the trial. Both were sentenced to death. The reason Ethel got the death sentence was the prosecution thought that she would end up naming names in order to save herself and end up getting life in prison. Well, Ethel never flipped. She never named names. She never admitted to doing anything to warrant being prosecuted. She had two sons who were left as orphans. And at the end of the entire incident in the early 1950s, Ethel Rosenberg turns out to be the only moral person in that whole story. It's very, it's sad. Wow. Now, here's an interesting piece of uh, uh, trivia, if you don't mind, and then I'm done. Um, There was a problem after they were uh, electrocuted about who was going to take the children the kids, into yeah. their homes. I remember that. Nobody in their family wanted to do it because they were afraid they'd be tainted with some sort of a communist taint. And and so they couldn't find a home. So a gentleman by the name of Abel Mirapol and his wife adopted these two children. Abel Mirapol was a poet and a songwriter who wrote the song Strange Fruit that Billie Holiday made a hit. So just an interesting connection. I mentioned that because that was in that race piece that I did that was on the internet. And yes. uh, it's just interesting. So it's it's a beautiful book. And if you're old enough to remember that whole thing, you might find it interesting. And especially if you're not, because I think p- people should read about a time from before they got here. I agree. I can't wait to introduce our guest. This man, I think, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, was one of the uh, one of two actors who spent all 11 seasons on Happy Days. I believe or he, he did. was the only yeah. one. Uh, and he got a Golden Globe nomination for Best Supporting Actor. A- after he that uh, uh, retired from that show, he had a, had a one, has a wonderful career as a prominent TV director. He directed Melrose Place and lots of other things. He's an inventor. He's had a spectacular career. And as I mentioned before, he truly is one of those people who is uh, part of the American culture. Uh, uh, this was one of the most successful shows ever in the history of television. Yes, pop culture history. Anson Williams. Anson, yeah. we're so happy to have you with us, my friend. Oh, well, nice to be here. I have to tell you guys, I didn't, I'm sitting here fascinated by your conversation. <laughs> oh, we, we do. I learned so much. Thanks. I mean, honestly, I'm going, oh, my God, thank God for you guys. You know, uh-huh. I'm a history buff. Yes. Major. And uh, you got, I'm, you got I'm, to read this I, I, was, book. I got lost. I'm just listening as an audience <laughs> member here. Going, Whoa, I didn't know That's that. Good. I didn't know that. I, if you're a history buff, you'll appreciate this uh, Ethel Rosenberg book. It's really I You'll also oh, appreciate you, this. That's a movie. Yeah. That is a movie. Yeah. Oh, Nobody yeah. knows about. You're, you're, you're giving details that... No one knows. Everybody has a, they're kind of a soundbite history. And they as a sound, what as you a, gave was a depth. I mean, her. I mean, who? I, I'm going. What? I'm going. What? Yeah, she was an opera singer. She was a wonderful mom. She was. She. She was a student of being a parent. And there, if, if I don't know how many people in our audience, Anson, excuse me, but I'll just interject this because you brought it up. Uh, yeah. The, there, uh, the uh, Angels in America, the trilogy by Tony Kushner, yeah. has a great sort of a fantasized dialogue between Roy Cohn and Ethel Rosenberg, played by Meryl Streep, which is breathtaking. Do you remember that? It was so good where she get him. I do remember that. I, I, yeah, I, I do remember that. They're, 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 and, and, Roy, and Roy Cohn lives today to, you know, who. Oh, yeah. So that's okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, the Soviets are, are very cagey, and in, back in the in the 50s, they attempted to seduce the left, so these would be idealistic people who you yes. know, think that communism seems like a really good idea compared to the evils of capital, capitalism. And now yes. that we're past the Soviet era, and Putin has said, oh, yeah, no, we like God. God, remember, like uh, we're Christians, uh, we've been Christians. Yeah, change the business model. A so now bit. they're going after the right much more successfully, actually, 
by being able to say that they're no longer godless, but that they, you know, we like uh, guns. You guys don't have any guns. Yeah. Isn't, uh, isn't society wonderful? <laughs> I mean, I, it's just people are easy. Isn't it wonderful how, how you can take something so natural and twist it 8 billion ways for your own, for your own needs and greed? I, I'm, I, oh my goodness. It's you overwhelming, know? but you know what anyway. remains pure, Anson, is the Happy Days lunchbox. So, there you go. There you is. put a smile on my face. So a smile, this, I mean, a smile is a good thing, right? So yeah. I want to know how I'm, so Anson is depicted on the lunchbox sipping some Coke through a straw with a plaid shirt. How often do you recreate this in the comfort <laughs> of your own home? Every morning? Never. 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 <laughs> Never. There's no contract to do in my own home. All right. Never. But, well, we want to know like, about about the lawsuit that ensued once you guys were gracing lunchboxes and and. Oh my God, the lawsuit! Oh gosh, you go you go there. You know, big business is an interesting commodity, and uh, there's just things. And you know, as many times you just have to bring light to uh, where you're getting screwed, and that's what we did. You know. Yeah, I mean, and, it's so um, it's so clear that it, you guys were all screwed. Just to set the table. But uh, but you know, but no, but it's it's not even the lawsuit. It's just, you know, and by the way, I'm in business. I, I've invented or been part of 50 products on QVC. And, and getting back to business, I, I'm a capitalist. I am, but I'm also with a heart. And with, and it's, and I've always felt, you know, this, this country is built on capitalism. Look, if you, years ago, after having five daughters, I had no time for a hobby anymore. <laughs> so my, my hobby was, I'm being, and I'm going, there's nothing more entrepreneurial than the creation of the United States of America. Yes. You know? and I'm going, and, and I, I really went, I go, seriously, I'm going, there's really 13 questionable people in Independence Hall. A lot of greedy people in there. We have Jefferson outside. We have Matt. We have uh, Franklin. We have Adams. And of course, you know, when Jefferson wrote the first pass of Declaration of Independence, he didn't stop slavery, but he basically said it stops where it is. And Adams and uh, Franklin sat him down and said, future generations, man, we got to get this thing through. Mm -hmm. We have 13 people in there. <laughs> you know, you, you, got, you can't put this in there or we're yeah. never going to get the Declaration of Independence. It's kind of like the way future Congress works are now. Have, they, they, future absolutely. generations are going to gonna have to deal with this. It's deal yeah. making so, and timing. Mm -hmm. Total deal making and timing and what? It, yeah. And all that. So, you know, um, where was I? No, oh, I, 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 we don't want to get into that because, truthfully, you probably you're in a non-disclosure situation with what you could reveal about that. But it was interesting, and it, and it uh, occupied. Well, and, 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 well, I'll, I'll, no, I know what I was going to say was this, and it's not disclosure. And I'm really, honestly, I'm so sick of social media and all this. They find that they find that 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 selling line, and yeah, but it's more than that. And I, I, I really, and. You know, I'm a very liberal guy, pretty much conservative in areas, way Biden, but you know, and um, <laughs> but it's like there's no laws. Everyone, there's no laws that is that's going to stop big business from doing the wrong thing ever. I, that's yeah. a good. The point. only thing that's going to stop this is the character of business. Period. The leader, the one who says yes, has to say, you know something. I have an extra ten dollars here that I really. I can do whatever I want with. My heart's going to tell me to like give back and help in whatever area instead of, oh, I want more. I want more. You want more for what? For ego? I mean, for but, what, for but what Anson, purpose? But Anson, so that the personality traits that contribute towards someone being successful in business often exclude empathy and altruism. Exactly. But yet our beginning, the big business guys early on, Carnegie, whatever. They gave back a yeah. lot. Yes. They gave back a lot. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and But then there's, I mean, Bill Gates is giving back a lot. He really is. Yes. Uh, Bezos, they, blah, blah. he's giving back more than anybody. Um, um, th there are there are major leaders that are doing it, but not enough. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just got to be, and, and you, it can't be rules. It can't be you have to. It has to be because you want to. Sure. What about, human, what, what about the tax inequity? You're a damn human being. You're a damn human, and you're going, you know, I want to get back. I, From my heart, I want to help people. You know, we have this gift. Some people have this gift, entrepreneurial wisdom, and and they, and, they, and that's, it's a wonderful thing. Most people don't have it. 
Most maybe, people are working for you to make it. Well, maybe it so, we could begin with early childhood education by you, you know, bet, enforcing. you bet, right from the get go. Encouraging just your character has got to be balanced. Yes. Of like, and it's so funny. Someone gave me the a, a very important gave me the best advice years ago, and I followed it. And he said, Anson, I, I see a fire in you, you and you're and you're in it, and you want to be successful, and you. And that's and absolutely be successful. And you want to do all this. And you want to climb that mountain. You want to really, really be successful. And he says, and it's important. And he says, and you're in it. Never be of it. That's it's what you do. It's not who you are. Wow. If all of a sudden you have to hide behind it, you're dead. Wow. It's over. Well, I'm going to talk it. about your entrepreneurial talents in just a minute. But uh, uh, I, you brought up a couple of really interesting points there. And I think uh, that... that uh, to, to paraphrase what you said, it should be uh, whether or not the the entrepreneurial person wants to give back. But I think what makes people mad is the tax inequity in this country. And, and I think people have a difficult time understanding uh, why they pay more taxes than Jeff Bezos does. And, and so I think that's the one thing that causes the resentment. It does cause resentment uh, and, and, and should cause resentment. But But at the same time, they're, they're all they're seeing one side of Jeff Bezos, one side. They don't know what he's doing from the from the outside in, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they it's for something with the media, you know, fear and anger sells, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, success doesn't. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, again, again, you know tax laws this law that law whatever people again it's the it's the character that that counts and one thing i know about jeff bezos he has given more to philanthropy than any billionaire in the world Mm -hmm. so say yes or no i mean he's given Mm -hmm. more back than any billionaire in the world that kind of says something you know uh Mm -hmm. so i don't know i'm not there's so much we don't know that we think we know, right? That or we that, then get angry about, or that we want then, to and, be true, and it, and it just echoes into this media frenzy of bullshit. Yeah, you know, I. There's mm-hmm. a lot that we want to be true because it matches the narrative in in our mind, and it matches the narrative. You got it, Match. but you know, but beyond that, forget all that. All that business, just business as a whole. America was built on business. America, mm-hmm. I mean, Franklin and Madison created the patent office. Why? To protect inventors. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they wanted because it had to be a fair situation. And they knew invention created the damn country. You know, it wasn't a socialist country. It's like, no, we need to grow. We need to build. We need to create. Incentivize ingenuity. That was from our founding fathers. They knew, and we by the way, and we knew that today from America. Absolutely. But it needs to be fair. Right. And, and, fair. and some of those founding fathers that, you know what, you bring up exactly what was one of the inciting incidents uh, with George Washington because he was a planter and, uh, and, yeah. and a grower. And he wanted equity in trade with Britain, which is the reason he got into all this stuff in the first place. He wanted yeah. to straighten uh-huh. that out. He didn't necessarily want to start a new country. He just wanted equity in trade, which yes. is a business thing. Yes. It was fairness. Mm-hmm. It was it, it was it was equality, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so what I'm saying is, so this country was built on entrepreneurialism, you know, and and good and good character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the beginning of this country, I mean, all these major honchos they built up, but they gave back. We got, you know, we had so much was philanthropy was given back, and that's kind of and all of a sudden. And also, we got into um, and the stock market used to be. For really good products, it's not. It's like you're 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 investing in something that's really good. That there's a passion of person. Man. It wasn't like let's turn them and burn them. Let's fake them out. Let's let's create something that they think is something that's nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, like the dot com period or whatever. Right. And, and oh, just make money. That wasn't the way this country was built. This country was built on solid invention and solid character. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yes, there's all these other problems within it. But in terms of business. It was solid invention, solid character, and they gave back a lot more then than they are today. And all I'm saying is, in gov- I mean, there's not Republican, Democrat, what I mean, liberal rules aren't going to change business. People are going to change business. The leaders are going to change business. You know, 
greed, the lack of greed is going to change business. Mm -hmm. And that's what, if every company just said, you know, I'm giving back 10%. 10%, I'm, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 would, it, would, it would be a new world here, you know, mm -hmm. but they don't do that. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden, oh, they're in the stock market, oh, our, our, you know, our, our, their stocks are going to do this. And people, every, everybody's, everybody's trying to please somebody instead of human existence you yeah, know so many masters and you know we see this you have to answer to stockholders right. and, and and the margins all and all that stuff all that <clears throat> and honestly enough of that enough of that it's wrong it's mm -hmm. just wrong and that's not any party or anything it's just wrong as human beings it's wrong we don't you know it, i want to work for you and, and Hans greed Williams. greed greed that's the word it's killing us Look who we put in as the goddamn president, for Christ's sakes, mm -hmm. yeah. for that time. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. no. A failed no. businessman. That's it. Someone who's who's portraying a successful businessman. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so An illusion. Let's, let's... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. A soundbite illusion. Yeah. An illusion. And it goes back to Wheezy's point. These guys have to be vetted. I hope we've learned that, uh, you know. The, the I mean, taxes our, have to be released, and they ha and their character has to be vetted. I think that I think the Democratic Party has learned that because the the Republican Party are are, are vultures. So we have to be squeaky clean because they're going to. I mean, you have to vet your own people the way the opposition would vet your people. So, but I understand too. But honest, but honestly, see, I mean, it, there's like it's it's turned into a monster. The Republican Party, Republican Party. But I like the idea of two parties. I like the idea of. Of the intelligent, balanced people with different views. I like that, and I like them getting together, and I like compromise. I like all, everybody has something can, to contribute. It used to be like that. One of the, the know, last things that whenever. one of the last things McCain said on the Senate floor was, "Can we oh, please can we please get back to regular order?" He was pleading yes. with us. He yes. knew he was on his way out. Mm -hmm. Can we please get back yes. to regular order? Mm -hmm. It hasn't yes. happened yet. John McCain and Joe Biden were best friends. Absolutely. Yeah. Until they were they ordered not to I mean, sit together. You know, they were. Okay. Ronald yep. Reagan and who was, who was, um, Tip oh my God. Tip, Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill. Mm -hmm. They'd have a whiskey in the White House. Yeah. Get, me couldn't, and they loved each other and they figured it out. You know, I love that. I love that. You know, there's, there's like, yeah, you have difference. But you come together, right. you know, and 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 that's government, you know. That's that's leadership. That's leadership as it should be. Why don't you yeah. run for office, Anson? I'm hearing a great couple of good campaign bites out of the. I you should run for public office, my friend. If I felt I could, I could really make a difference. I would. I think you can do better outside being in the office. I think you get in that office. It's so hard now. Mm -hmm. To get your voice through and, mm -hmm. and and just and just all the spinning or whatever to stop you and taint you and yeah. whatever. You know? so There's you're... so much interference being run. But it's I want so to go much back. Interference. It's really. It's I want to go really back to the, to the set of Happy Days. You're a kid on the set of Happy Days, and you yeah. wind up. All you guys wind up directing. Did you stand mm -hmm. around with Ron and and Henry and talk about what your dreams were? Gosh, I never. It's so funny. Happy Days. What a special time, guys! Mm -hmm. um, it's it was, who you know, where these young people. Actually, Ron was already a star. You know, he was already very well known. Mm -hmm. uh, Henry wasn't. I wasn't. Donnie was it? And Ron was a big influence because we kind of. He, and he, Ron is just. He's always had a heart of gold. Always, always so down to earth. Incredibly selfless. And we had Gary Marshall, our our mentor, our our. Our boss, who mm -hmm. hired us, our create, who all who inspired us to take our positions as young actors, and and educate ourselves uh, to become more involved in the business. Because mm -hmm. he, he said, "You got you're here you're here on the Paramount lot. You got to learn. You know you, you might not be actors all your life, especially you, Anson. But what? He said, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, so and he goes. He inspired us to take instead of getting full of ourselves." to really use use the Paramount lot like a college. Wow. And as far as, and you know, Ron always wanted to direct, always. I mean, he was born to direct. And in fact, Ron and I did quite a few projects together. We did one called Skyward with Bette Davis. Yeah. Uh, 
way back. And I, I wrote the story and he directed, we both exec produced. And uh, it was the first time a disabled actress played the lead in the show. And she wanted to fly movie. a plane, right? Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, but, and then, and then when I said, you know, I really wanted to get into directing. So Gary, Gary said, there's plenty of directors on the lot. Go, just go out there and just stand by them. Mm-hmm. So I went, okay. I stood by Roland Polanski while he's doing China Sound in the back. Wow. I stood by, yeah, I stood by so many different people. And then when they were shooting Grease, I, I watched all the musical numbers being shot, how to do that. Day of the Locust. I mean, I was there, I was there by John Schlesinger, right by his side. Every time, every time I had a minute, I was right next to John Schlesinger being a pain in the ass, asking questions. And they go, where did you learn to direct? Well, I didn't really, I, mean, I kind of learned my craft from that. And then as far as comedy, we had the greatest director in the world, Jerry Paris, mm-hmm. directing Happy Days, who won four Emmys for Dick Van Dyke. And, you know, I mean, just a brilliant comedy director. Uh, you might have known him from, from the Dick Van Dyke show. Not only did he, did he direct it, he played D- Jerry the Dennis sure. next door. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was an actor first. Yeah. So I just, Gary Marsh, he wanted, he opened up this opportunity for education. Right. And all of us, all of us, we didn't care about our dressing rooms. We didn't care about this. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't get involved in baloney. We got involved in real substantial, you know, helpful um, parts of show business. And, and, and that's why, and honestly, thanks to Gary and Ron Howard inspiring us, that's why we're still active today. Because we used it productively. Mm-hmm. You know, we really did. We, just, we used it as a college. And um, it gave us just so much opportunity to see if we're good at anything. You know, and, and, and thank goodness we wore. And we were able to progress with our lives. But maybe you know? he was able to and, cast, yeah. you know, and handpick good people because he knew that you were going to become a family. I don't, but he, well, no, you know, and that's funny you said that. It wasn't being a family. Can you play baseball? It was, can you play baseball? <laughs> did really you was. go, did he, you go to his memorial service at the Valley Performing Arts Center? Oh God. Were you there? Yes. And I, I, I told oh, yeah. Barbara, Barbara Marshall, his wife, I said, you missed an opportunity to make what have probably would have been the greatest television special in the history of television. That was a spectacular event. I mean, Bette Midler sang, Tom Hanks was hysterical, uh, Julia Roberts. But I'll tell you what really affected me by that. And I would love to get you to comment on this man that was Gary Marshall. I knew him. I did my one-person shows at his theater over there. But, but all, all you could see in the, in, the, in the film clips and the impromptu interaction of him with his actors was love. This man was loved and loved people. It was really uh, unbelievable the energy this man put out and people were attracted to. I, I, actually, I'm going to share you with something. Share you right now. I had my birthday um, with my girlfriend um, a couple of nights ago. Happy birthday. And, and someone who I've been very, very much a mentor to was his son, Scotty. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He kind of ran that whole deal. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> know if you can see this, but Scotty came to the party and he gave me this. Wow. And oh. he gave me this. It's maybe the greatest gift oh. I've ever gotten yeah. in, my, in my life from outside of family. Scott is Gary's son. And has the same Gary cadence, Scotty. the same voice, or the same sense of humor. It's like you're talking to a young Gary. Same. I'm look. I said, Scotty, I, I, you, you're Gary. You look. You're a little <laughs> short. You're a little shorter, but you're Gary. Can you read but it? Here's the thing. Here, this is what he sent me. Okay. This is forty. So, and remember, I first met Scotty when I was six years old, mm-hmm. and helped mentor him as a director and everything. Since that time, he goes, <clears throat> "Happy birthday, Anson." I found this in my dad's desk drawer. Oh, my. He used to carry it in his wallet. Mario Mendoza had the lowest batting average in the major <laughs> leagues. But he was still in the major leagues. <laughs> okay. My dad always said, make sure your work is above the Mendoza line. <laughs> which meant you're still in the big leagues. Wow. You helped my 
you helped my dad make it to the bigs and you have managed to stay there. Oh my. I thought you would like this to remember him by love Scotty. And it's Mario Mendoza's baseball card. Oh, wow. Wow. That Gary kept with him in his wallet. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Now what that gift. doesn't tell you the long term connection of happy days. Mm -hmm. Nothing will. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that very personal life. story with us. We appreciate it. Plus, he was so fast and so funny. I did my one-person shows, and it, you know, it would take me a year to write these things, and I'd be re rehearsing on the stage, and Gary would walk by, because I did him at the Falcon Theater, now the Gary Marshall Theater, and he'd yeah. walk by, and he'd stand there and listen for two minutes, and he would say, hey, why don't you try this line? And the line would be far funnier than anything it took me a year to write. Oh, yeah. He would just pop off immediately, and I thought, well, there's the Gary Marshall gift. Man. Yeah, here's a gift. Here's a, I'll tell you what. We were doing... We're thinking, anyway, I, there, there, there was a scene with Henry and Ron, and we're going over and over and over it, and they couldn't find a button for the scene. And r the scene was Ron's, you say, Ron is just like, like a psychologist, just like, oh, Fonzie, this is wrong. Oh, my God, Fonzie, this is wrong. Oh, my God. And he's, he's just from his heart, just telling all his woes, right? Mm -hmm. And they couldn't figure out a tag. Gary, and they call Gary, you got to come down from the office. And he, he comes down. He watches the scene. He goes, Henry, <laughs> right about here, take a paper towel, fold it up, and make it like a priest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That, and it was like, and that was the, I went, I'm, we're freaking hysterical. Oh, man. <laughs> That's Gary Marshall. Yeah, he was so There's fast. Gary Marshall, man. man. It's, like, I'm, it's like, just pull it out of the air, man. It's like, where did that? Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, you know? It's beautiful. Yeah. So let's talk about your book and Willie, because Willie is, I think, the oh. the, the central character of, of your book, a man who, because you know where the lessons are, Anson. You know where they are, and you know oh, yeah. when to take them to heart. So talk about him for us. Well... It's so funny. Um, a friend of mine was at Reader's Digest, and they were doing they were doing um, some section where, where they needed uh, because uh, honestly, I was kind of known for Forrest Gump stories of like, what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was kidnapped by the president. President of the United States daughter, literally at the White House. It's crazy. So I think we really need a couple of these funny stories. So I and I. I, by the way, I had never written ever a magazine article, ever. So I said, yes, yeah. so I wrote a couple of these stories, and it hit me. And I just wrote this, and, and actually it's in the book, right? Um, it, there'd be no stories without, there, there'd be no stories without Willie Turner. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went through, because I'm, I'm 15, and I, I, I'm 15, and a, 15 years old, and uh, very insecure. I had a, I, a family was there for me, but I had a father who was out of World War II, two Purple Hearts, war hero. Oh, wow. um, never had a never had a chance to come down from from the horror of war. Mm -hmm. So when you're brought up with that, it's a pretty it's a pretty um, challenging time as a child. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was a very and uh, not confident, whatever. And I got this job, and, and we didn't have money. You know, it's like it was like really lower, lower middle class. And um, I had to work for anything. And I got a job as assistant janitor at Leonard's department store uh, while I was going to high school, beginning of high school. And um, my boss was Willie Turner, who was an African-American, uh, not well educated and a functioning alcoholic. Always had the little flask, you know, and a prophet. And he had, he had a, a, the janitorial room where all those supplies were. There were two oil drum cans. And that, those were the, that was the seating in the room. <laughs> so you'd sit, and we'd sit there. And he's the first person I remembered that talked to me, not at me. Okay. And this man was so influential. We wouldn't be talking today without Willie Turner. Wow. Was so influential in, in my life. I mean, 
he understood me and he, he connected with me. He was like free therapy. And by the time I was done with that job, I knew who I was and had the confidence to move forward. He found confidence in me. It was so interesting. He found the entrepreneurial ability, the entrepreneurial ability of me. Mm -hmm. He was the one that actually triggered me. Because one of our jobs um, it was um, sweeping and and uh, and uh, waxing the floors every night. Mm -hmm. Big, huge aisle, aisles, right? And we and we had um, we had already unpacked all these new refrigerators for the appliance department, and um, it, it, it was the first refrigerators where you didn't need, where you didn't need, you didn't need ice cubes or anything. You, it literally was a freezer that made your food cold. And, and th that wasn't, a, it was without ice, without anything. It wasn't it was a big ice deal. box, yeah. Yeah. So I, we set up, and we're, and we're going by, sweep, sweeping and waxing. And I go, hey, Willie, freeze your freezer, not your food. He goes, that's good, boy. What do you mean? That's good. Freeze your freezer, not your food. And he goes, that's good, boy. Oh, anyway, anything, <laughs> I'm going, a few days later, there's this banner up, freeze your freezer, not your food. Wow. And it became the, the and they sold all the, they sold out the refrigerators. Holy cow! And he went and they went. You and he gave me credit. All of a sudden, I'm like this hero in the appliance <laughs> department yeah. at 15 years old. Wow! It reminds me and, of the and janitor. And that, but that was and that's Willie Turner, African American, uneducated, some and yet made my bro. So I said, man, never judge ever. Where you're going to get your magic? Don't ever judge. That's there might be someone story. just on the street that has. It's be, also kind know, of like be, it's a reminder that each one of us has the ability to tremendously influence any young person that we encounter if we huge, choose to focus on. Yeah. Huge influence mm -hmm. if it's real and from the heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. If it's real, huge. Well, that I. So what happened? Anyway, getting back to the book, they said we. Uh, I did these two things, and all of a sudden the publisher says, "This is a book." They said write a book now everyone's trying like hell to get published here i here i it's in my lap right wow. and i thought and after it because he really loved that opening about willie right so i said okay but i'm not getting i don't want to do a book about some old sitcom guy and here's some sitcom stories and ha 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 i said i want to pay forward willie i said my this book's going to be about putting everyone that reads it into the into the same same janitorial room, which Willie called the talk room. He mm -hmm. said it's the talk room. I wanted I wanted them to have the same conversations with Willie that I had that helped my life. Right. So it's a tribute. The whole book's a tribute to Willie. And yes, there's all these crazy stories, you know, like wild Forrest Gump stories. Meeting Elvis Presley in a parking lot in Monroe, Louisiana, getting kidnapped by, by President of the United States daughter, on and on and on. But all of it comes back to a lesson from Willie, mm -hmm. how I got there. Right. It always pays back, always goes back to the talk room, <laughs> always goes back to that conversation. And I thought, well, I said, that's a worthwhile book to me because it's because I'm using me to to <clears throat> push Willie's just amazing life affirming presence to them mm -hmm. i wanted th i wanted them to have that same conversation i had mm -hmm. i knew it would help people's lives and that's what i did and, it's, and the reason it's called sing to a bulldog is because um and actually that was the the editors she goes because i had i had a chapter called sing to a bulldog and she goes well that's the title <laughs> and i go why she said because because it made you it, it really made every i go what do you and, it made, and it, then it made sense because Jump the Shark, you know, the Jump the Shark came from Happy Days. Mm -hmm. And Jump the Shark actually, it's pretty, it's it's, not, it's pretty much all in void because when when Fonzie jumped the shark, we went on for five more years. Yeah. So it wasn't the end of Happy Days. But basically they thought, well, we jumped, meaning we're at a point where everything's not going up, it's going down. Jump the Shark means you're going down. Okay. Well, seeing the Bulldog, um, Back then, we didn't make the money uh, that actors make today on series. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, it was like fun, but it was nowhere near rich. Mm -hmm. 
And I've always been one to see what I have, not what I didn't have. I met David Cassidy and he told me how much better he did off the show by singing on the show. And the first year of Happy Days, the Brady Bunch was still going, but they were, but I've talked to Barry Williams and they were making so much more money off the show singing as the Brady Bunch mm. around. And I'm going, hmm. Mm -hmm. And I sang. I came out of I came out of theater, nightclubs. I sing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if I can if I could convince Gary Marshall to create a band and I could sing on the show, I might be able to make some money. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one early one morning, uh, just before shooting, I found him. And he said, talk to me later. I said, no, no, it'll only take a minute. He goes, you got a minute. Walk with me. Walk with me. I walk with him. I say, Gary, you got girls on the show. You got cars on the show. We need a band in Arnold's. I sing. He goes, a band in Arnold's? A band? It stopped. He went, a band? I used to, he goes, I used to be a drummer. A band? And he goes, you sing? <laughs> I go, yeah. He goes, are you good? I go, yeah, I think I'm okay. Oh, 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 you know, there's a show coming up with a paternity and I like, I'm going to put, you, you're good. You're good. I, go, <laughs> I think I'm okay. I, I mean, yeah, I'm good. He goes, okay. We're, yeah, go, go. I want you to talk to Bobby, associate producer, and pick a song. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm walking wow. away and then all of a sudden I hear, but you're singing to a bulldog. I go, what? You're singing. He goes, I, he goes, you know, I don't have time to listen. I trust you. I think you're, but you know, Elvis sang to a bulldog and Ed Sullivan. It'll be, yeah, yeah. Pick, you, you'll sing to a bulldog. It'll be funny. He goes, that way, if you're bad, if you're bad, I get laughs. If you're good, I get laughs. <laughs> so there I am on national freaking television singing, I'm all shook up to a bulldog. <laughs> yeah. That's however, funny. however, however, it was very, he liked it. He liked it. And and I got to sing maybe every third show after that. And I got to ch choose the music, even got to write some of it. And and, and then I got and also oh, I got signed by Chelsea Records, the same label as David Cassidy. Wow. And I don't mean to and also I'm making twelve hundred dollars an episode. And seventeen thousand dollars a night doing a concert. Wow. wow. All because of finding you know what I had and not what I didn't have. Mm -hmm. I saw what was positive, not what not, not what was negative. Right, right. Right. And so I thought, and she said, "What a great title for the book." Sing, seeing the bulldog is climbing your mountain. Sing means it was the beginning of something great. Right. So that that was the reason for the title, and also and for, and for people out there, it was like, please see what you have, what you don't have. There was a <clears throat> really inspiring to me years ago in high school. I was trying to get a job at the smokehouse as a dishwasher, anything in Burbank. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and of course I didn't get it, but it was a famous story. Um, there was um, a dishwasher there, uh, not that well educated, had entrepreneurial feelings and didn't like the soap that was at the restaurant. Didn't like, and he went, he created his own soap. <laughs> And he brought it to the restaurant. All of a sudden, the dishes were cleaner. And people, also, it built, he became a millionaire from creating a dish soap. Wow. As a, in, you're going, what opportunities there at a sink with dishes? He found it. He found a million dollars at that sink mm. because he, 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 he used it productively and, and with vision and with passion. And that's what made this country. But if we go back, echo back, that's what made this country. The Smokehouse has started a lot of uh, wealth because George Clooney's production company is called Smokehouse Productions. So a lot of interesting <laughs> inventions isn't that it? Yeah, have come out of the Smokehouse. Just, just as there you go. Well, let's talk you about go. your your, in, your invent your invention career, Anson, and what it is that you that you have now that you think that people would make people's you know like you talk about finding a need and filling it something of quality right so what is it that well, you're that you uh, have created oh i agree no one does anything by themselves mm -hmm. it's like a lot of things happen to me um you know it's a very interesting story <clears throat> do you realize 
not people, not many people know this. They haven't written about it. I don't know if the Heimlich maneuver would be here as big as it is today without Happy Days. You know that? Really? Heimlich maneuver, one hundred percent. Just to give you an idea, you need to talk about where the Heimlich maneuver came from and your family. Doctor Heimlich, Hank, was my second cousin, uh, but I call I've called him Uncle ever since I was born. Very selfless man, um, and he was married to. Jane Heimlich, who was one of Arthur Murray's twin daughters. That's so interesting. Remember Arthur Murray Dance yeah, Studio? Of course. Yeah, of I mean, quite an entrepreneur himself. He, she was a big uh, influence on Hank, because uh, Hank was in charge of the Jewish Hospital in Cincinnati, uh, this and that, and it, it opened him up to for alternatives in a lot of areas of medicine. And they had a friend or something die from choking which influenced Hank to find a better solution than just patting people on the back. And uh, he also was this, uh, very much an activist. And he created the maneuver, but the Red Cross at the time uh, was doing certain things that he disagreed with and, uh, and was very public about it. It was more of a political thing. And because of that, the Red Cross wouldn't accept the maneuver. They kept pushing, slapping on your back. And they tried to demean the maneuver. And he was getting a bit of uh, promotion here and there in certain regional areas, but, but not enough to break out the maneuver. And one day, he, he happened to be in L.A., and he was visiting the Happy Day set. And, you know, the Happy Day set, the reason there's a set is because of many, many people. Gary Marshall, Ron, a lot of people made it, made, were part of that success to have the sets, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that comes off that set, everyone's involved in. Right. So he's there and he's talking to me about the frustration of, of getting national attention for the maneuver. And a call came, came through and it was from the Merv Griffin show. And I had done the show a couple of times before and Merv was a, just a very nice guy. And um, someone had dropped out that night. And they asked if I was available to just fill in, sing a song, get interviewed, and all that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, wow, ignorantly, <laughs> maybe we can get the maneuver on Merv Griffin, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, national television. So I said, absolutely, 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 I'll be there. So I got done with rehearsal that day. And, and, and I told Dr. Heim, like, hey, maybe maybe we can get the, the maneuver some attention. I don't know. And we got, so I get down to the Merv Griffin show. Merv's not available. Uh, I give I give the charts to the band and uh, rehearse because I, I did a song and no Merv. And then the, then the producer comes in to interview, to like discuss what you're going to talk about. No Merv. And well, we tried, we tried. So they, Dr. They, gave, they gave Dr. Heimlich a nice seat in the audience and um, <clears throat> and the show went on. And I wasn't first out, maybe I was second, third, I don't know, but um, came out, sang the song. And then, then there's this, um, you know, commercial break. So I was, that, that's when they take you over to sit next to Merv to get ready to be interviewed. <laughs> well. I had nine, I had, I, 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 you know, I did an elevator pitch. Hey, Merv, do you ever hear the Highland Maneuver? He's in the, the, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, wait a minute. I read something about that. For some gift from God, he heard about it. He goes, very interesting. He's, where is he? He's right. Very interesting. Lights come up. Out of the blue. And Dick Carson directed the show, Johnny Carson's brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't even know. Merv said, you know, Anson just told me something interesting here. Is there a Dr. Heimlich in the audience? He has them stand up, interviews him, has them come on stage, does a maneuver on Merv, saves lives from that. Wow. The booker of the Carson show happened to be looking at that show. Oh. Three weeks later, Henry's on, on Johnny Carson doing it, and it was over. It was done. It became part of America. Wow. <laughs> but, That's a great story. Yeah. 
if it wasn't for happy days, and and, and, if you can imagine all the connections it took Mm. to make that happen. I mean, there, there are, there are, there are network people. There are people that are our part of lives today being saved and they don't even know it. Yeah. But it's astounding. It it was, it was all um, just that moment of time that one, and what that's crazy. But But, that's one of the things about you, Anson, is that you, you take advantage of that moment. You don't hang back. You step forward. And that's an oh, instinct yes. that you've been blessed with. Oh, yes. Oh, you've got. And then and, and I know what you're talking about. To, and to continue saving lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really don't like promoting products. And, but, but we want you but to. This and we're at, product. So we've posed the question. This, hey, Anson, what would you this, like to promote? This has saved so many lives already. And honestly, the, the, the accolades mean nothing. We've been honored by the United States Congress and City of L.A., California State Senate, all that. But that really is wonderful, great. What really matters is, because the Dr. Heimlich's brilliance is stopping tragedies. And it, it, and it, ha- it started decades ago. I was directing a show, and it was a really hard day out in the desert. I'm driving home. I fell asleep at the wheel. Wow. Scared the hell out of me. Right. Woke up, and thank God I didn't kill myself or anyone else, but it scared me. And when I talked to Hank about it, and by the way, this is after happy days. Mm-hmm. He said, Anson, he goes, you know, I, he says, have cut up lemons in the car with you on exhausting days. I go, why? He said, bite into it. He said, citric acid, sour lemon, hits the lingual nerve on top of your tongue. And he said, it's no different than going to the doctor, getting reflex reaction with your, your arm or your knees. There's sensory connection of tongue and brain and reflex uh, reaction. And he said, if you put sour lemon and citric acid on top of your tongue, the lingual nerve, it, 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 it will it will cause um, a reflex reaction of adrenaline Boop! instantly. Boop. Wow. Your body will wow. react with adrenaline. Okay. Nothing in your system. It's just boop, you're up, you're alert, you, and you're, you'll save a life. Mm-hmm. You won't fall asleep. You get off the road, and you'll be safe. And we also found out, well, exhaustion is a major, major. Beyond that, um, anyway, so I did that for years. I would just have cut up lemons. And then, you know, I got, you know, you know, I became an inventor and this and that. And, and I love I love finding problems, sol- inventing problem solving products. Mm-hmm. I just love that. Mm-hmm. It's exciting to me as entertainment show business. I just loved it. Yeah. And then I was but I was reading about the drowsy driving and, um, and, and, and we get all the same drunk driving. But and I'm going, and it's bad. Right. But I went, like, you know, there are there are. There's twice as many deaths and tragedies with drowsy driving than medicated or drunk driving combined. Wow. It is catastrophic. It is catastrophic. Yeah. It's, wow. it's huge. One out of five admits to falling asleep at the wheel. Right. Aside from that, exhaustion in the workplace. Kids studying all night, going to the hospital, drinking too much caffeine, energy drink, screwing up sleep patterns. And all you need to be is alert, safely. Mm-hmm. And I call up Dr. Heimlich and I said, Hank, I said, there's this big problem. I said, and being a citric acid, sour lemon water, I mean, how about a spray drop? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, a spray drop. Well, why can't we just spray the top of the tongue? He goes, oh my God, absolutely. He said, it's a direct hit. You'll definitely save more lives than high maneuver. More people are exhausted than, than choking. So he helped me develop alert drops. Okay. And what this is, it's so simple. It's just, you're feeling tired. You're feeling, a little, you just do Oh, and instantly hitting the lingual nerve, you're up, you're alert, and you won't kill yourself or somebody else. Mm-hmm. And it has been an incredibly important part of people's lives. So what I'm saying here is if people go to alertjobs.com, alertjobs.com, no, you can read all about it. You can read Dr. Heimlich's story. You can, MIT did studies on citric acid and sour lemon 50 years ago. I mean, scientific proof of like crazy it's it's old science we just made a better scooter that's all <laughs> and it has helped so many families and, I, and and for me it's like it's such a simple device yeah. i love it because it's not over caffeinating yourself it's not coffee it's oh. not red bull and you're poisoning your whole system with well, it well red bull, red bull is bullshit the energy drinks if the fda would take them off the shelf years ago they're they're poisonous they're terrible for you uh-huh. But 
they are so powerful now with lobbyists and whatever that they're not going to go off the shelf. And they don't do, by the way, they don't do the job. And caffeine doesn't do the job. It takes 20 minutes for caffeine to even take effect. And honestly, you need too much of it. And it mm-hmm. makes you shaky mm-hmm. and it screws up your sleep pattern. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just it's just a merry ground of exhaustion. It's all it's it's all it, the only two things that work ever on the lingual nerve to, to make you alert, to to wake you up, to get you home safely without screwing up your sleep pattern, without stuffing your system. Naturally, it's either alert drops or hot peppers. And hot peppers, like that, you'll, that's it, we, it's too much. It's way too much. It's like you, it's so jarring. <laughs> but but and what I tell people, so I say, you don't want to buy, don't buy this, don't buy it. Fine, half cut up lemons with you. Okay. And you start feeling, you bite into those, that will save your life. All right. Well, we're so gonna all put, we did was make it we're gonna a put bit a more to- comfortable and much and much more direct. And by the way, this thing here will last you over 80 sprays it's over a month it's it's less than two starbucks coffees all right wow. all right we're gonna put yeah. a link to that in our show notes anson and uh, we we just appreciate you for creating that because i know you know that you've saved lives yes it has saved lives but that's dr heimlich all i did i would have never had that knowledge man i don't i'm not how would i would have, I'm, are you kidding what are you working on right now, Anson? Either invention-wise or show business-wise? Oh my gosh! Um, well, I don't want. To, we have um, a few very entertaining things that we're. You know, one thing we're doing. It's it, it, especially with the uh, COVID and all this. You know, and there's it, it, people need to laugh a lot. You know. Yeah. And it's funny. So we have you know America's uh, funniest uh, America's funniest home videos, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we have uh, America's Funniest Joke dot com. Oh, cool. So we're developing we're developing a show America's Funniest Joke from real people wherever. So it's it's kind of a it's a really fun project. That's good awesome. for you. Yeah, we'll check. Yeah. That out. Well, oh, yeah. I'll tell you, um, the, the fun thing about this show is getting to interview somebody who's been part of your life and finding out that what you know about them and their role in Happy Days is about a tenth of this three dimensional person that you are. You're an inventor. You have great political oversight. And uh, I just enjoyed this conversation so much. Thank you so well, much. I did too. And you guys are you guys are very special because you allowed this conversation. Aww. It's really, in fact, in fact, when I was just listening to you before joining you, I, 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 I got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we, I, God, I have so much to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. That's quite a compliment. Unfortunately, you have a rich past, so we had to get into some of that stuff. Otherwise, we could have just talked on about all the things we started to talk about. It was fun. Yes. All right, Fritz, how can other people find this show? All right, if you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, and I know you did, it would help us to be more discoverable by potential new listeners. If you leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog. You'll find binge-worthy stuff in there. I'm telling you, Gary Puckett and Henry Winkler and Keith Morrison and Diane Warren and Bill Medley and, and, and the Livingston Brothers from My Three Sons, which... Uh, Anson probably knows we have lots of stuff going back to the very very beginning thank you for spending an hour with us and we would be overjoyed if you took a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend thanks for listening and we've got a new feature coming up Fritzy which is we're going to be reading review highlights so if you go ahead and leave us a review we may read a highlight from your review and I may even put it to music and maybe Anson will sing it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter where we are at Media Path Pod and on Facebook where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content and links to all of Anson's wonderful projects and uh, products. Uh, on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast, we would love to know what media you have been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guest, Anson Williams. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the Media Path.